The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. And the script was used to take the journey of a lifetime and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program. Good evening to everybody this evening. We are so glad you've joined us again. Those of you who are watching on television this evening, welcome. If you're watching on the internet, we are so glad you have joined us. And for all those at our downlink sites, welcome again this evening. We are going to take an amazing journey tonight. Star Wars on Patmos. Why is there so much suffering in our world today? But before we begin tonight, we really need to ask God to help us to understand. So let's pray together, shall we? Father, tonight, blow like the wind in this place. Burn like a fire in our hearts. Draw us to God. Father, tonight may we understand. Pull back the curtain so we can understand what is going on behind the scenes. Send your spirit tonight to every person. In Jesus' name, amen. I have travelled to Auschwitz in Poland. So, Malanga i Polani. And look through that concentration camp where some one million Jews perished during the Second World War. Innocent children. Young married couples with their life ahead of them. Gassed in the gas ovens, gas chambers in Auschwitz. I was looking there at one picture. This lady and the little children here. Underneath was the caption. Off to the gas chamber. Why is there so much suffering in our world? A young woman studying medicine with a great career in front of her something snapped and now she's in a home for those who are suffering mental illness. She will never achieve her goals. Her life is shattered. Why is there so much suffering, my friend? A family are driving down the freeway. Having a great time. Laughing together. They're excited, they're on a holiday. And a drunk man smashes into them. And the father and the mother are dead. And the little children have to know parents now. Why is there so much suffering? We watch those haunting pictures from Africa. People whose lives will never be like yours and mine. 
the problem of human suffering raises some very big questions for many people. Come with me this evening to the island of Patmos. Beautiful place to visit in the Aegean Sea in Greece today. Patmos 2,000 years ago was a Roman prison really. And to this place John the Beloved was exiled by the Romans. You can visit the cave where they say John had his great revelations. Well, we're not really sure if this was the place. But this is where the tourists come to think about the visions that John was given 2,000 years ago. But somewhere on the shores of this little lonely island, John saw amazing things. And tonight we're going to begin by looking at what John saw. Let me tell you, you can understand the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation begins with a promise. Blessed are those who read it. Who hear it. And who put it into practice. The book Revelation yeah, means an unveiling and it's Jesus Christ who gave the revelation. And you are going to understand so much of this book as we travel through this series together. There was John on the island of Patmos. And tonight we want to go back to the beginning. In fact, before the beginning. John takes us before the beginning of life on this planet. Before the beginning of history. And before the beginning of human suffering. We're going way back tonight. John saw in the center of Revelation a gigantic cosmic conflict, a war between good and evil that has been raging for centuries. In the center of the Revelation, John sees three evil powers. You are going to understand who these powers represent. He saw a dragon, a beast that came up out of the ocean, a beast that came up out of the land. But tonight we want to unmask and understand who the dragon is. We'll look at the other two players later on. And during our series. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 we begin. In Revelation chapter 12 9. John says. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Do you see my friend this evening in just one verse you understand one symbol of revelation. This book explains itself. John said the dragon represents Satan, that ancient serpent. Now, some places I share this, these are messages. They say, do you really believe in the devil? 
familia ete matuata li tonu ea ili ti apolo. Well, in the Pacific Islands, it's a little easier to believe in the devil, isn't it? Because sometimes we see his activities in black and white, so to speak. But where I come from, many people think this being does not exist. He surely does, my friend. Jesus believed in the existence of the devil. The Bible says he cast out demons many times. You know, there was a, an interesting story that comes out of China. There were some Chinese bandits that used to come down at harvest time to a certain village and they would steal the harvest that the villagers had gathered in. And uh, one day, the people decided to set up to arm themselves. So that when the bandits came next time, they would be ready for them. And when the bandits came at harvest time next time, they drove them away. This went on for two or three harvests. Until the bandit, the head bandit, got a good idea. One day he went into the forest and saw an old man from the village. He said, old man, you go back to the village and you tell the people the bandit is dead. There's nothing to worry about anymore. So the old man wanted some money so the man, the bandit gave him money and he went and spread the rumor that the bandit was dead so the village people said, said we don't need our, our weapons anymore at guess who turned up when the harvest was gathered the bandit turned up he would love Satan would love us to believe he doesn't exist tonight. Because then he has one up on us. Let me give you the evidence tonight that this being exists all right. Archaeology supports the biblical claim that there is a devil. Come with me back to the Ishtar gates in Babylon, remember? These, of course, are in the Berlin Museum in Germany today. You will notice some animals on those gates there. One of them is the dragon down the bottom there. Now, the dragon for the Babylonians was a symbol of evil. Come with me to the place called Persia or Iran today. This was the great city of Persepolis. We were there just last year. This palace or great number of palaces has some interesting carvings. And here you see Darius. That's Darius the Great mentioned in the Bible. He is fighting a Hiraman, the dragon. And a Hiram and the dragon for the Persians was a symbol of evil again. The idea of the dragon representing evil is certainly supported outside of the Bible. Now who is this dragon devil? How do we understand him? Where did he come from? The Bible tells us. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 7, verse 7. 
And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. Now that's a strange verse, isn't it? Of all places you would not expect a war, it's heaven. But the Bible says war broke out in heaven. That's the clear teachings of the Bible. Come with me to the real Star Wars tonight. Those Star Wars movies of George Lucas. Some of you probably saw them. The Empire Strikes Back. The Return of the Jedi. These are fictitious wars. But they actually draw their idea from the original Star Wars. The wars that are mentioned in the Bible. Now there are two pictures of this devil or Satan in the Bible. We go to the first one in the book of Ezekiel. And the Bible uses the king of Tyre as a front for the devil. The devil never, never comes with a pitchfork in his hand. And a couple of horns on his head. And a pointy tail. <laughs> he always uses other things to do his work. And in the book of Ezekiel, he is the power behind the king of Tyre. So let's notice Ezekiel 28. Verse 12 to 14. Here is the first picture of Satan. You were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom. And perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. The garden of God. The workmanship of your timbrels. And your pipes. Was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you, says God. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stone. Now you see uh, the picture here of this being. So who is he? Who is this dragon devil who dared to war against God? Here are the first things we know about him. One thing is this. He was once in the Garden of Eden, we just read. This is obviously wasn't true of the king of Tyre. He came many centuries later. This is the power behind the king of Tyre. The Bible says he was created by God. The devil is not a divine being. God created him at a point in time. He, in fact, was the anointed cherub. Now, a cherub is a type of one of the forms of the angels. He was God's guardian angel. He was number one angel. The Bible says in Ezekiel 28 verse 15, You were perfect in your ways from the very day that you were created until 
sin was found in you. You see what the Bible is saying? God made a perfect being who one day sinned against God. So there's the picture first of all. He was created by God and he was created perfect by God. God did not create a devil. This being became a devil. So what was the sin that was found in him? Let's notice what the Bible says. Ezekiel 28 verse 17 now. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. You notice my friend, this being got proud. This is where it started. Pride or self-centeredness was what set this perfect being on a course that made him the devil. Which brings us to picture number two now. We go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14 now. Verse 12. Notice what the Bible says. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. Son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You see, Lucifer is a Latin word which means the day star. This being was once full of light. Now we go to Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 13 and 14 for you have said in your heart now watch what he says I will ascend into heaven I will exalt my throne above the stars of God I, I will also sit on the mountain of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You notice this, this being's got a problem. He's got an eye problem, hasn't he? He's got eye disease. This is it, my friend. The day star. I. 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 In other words, pride. The middle letter of pride is I. Never forget it. The middle letter of Lucifer is I. The middle letter, my friend, of sin is I. <laughs> this is it. I is the problem. The desire to take God's place, you see. To be in control where God should be in control. And that's the same problem in your life and my life and our world today. We want to do it our way. My way instead of God's way. And when we do that, we affect the lives of other people. This is where it started, my friend. The love of power. And so the devil now begins a campaign of deceit so as to discredit God. That's always the way it happens. 
Lies are told about others. Because then we are lifted up ourselves, you see. And so eventually, war broke out in heaven, the Bible says. Lucifer became Satan. God did not create a devil. Does a woman give birth to a drunkard? No. She gives birth to a beautiful little baby. Who by their choices becomes what they become. God created a perfect being called Lucifer. Who by his choices ended up becoming the devil. And the Bible says he took one third of the angels with him. Revelation 12, verse 3 and 4. Back to that center part of the Bible, the Revelation. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns or diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to the earth. Who are the stars? John tells us. Revelation 12, 9. So the great dragon was cast out of heaven that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world he was cast out to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So now you've learned another symbol tonight. The stars represent angels here. And that's what John tells us in Revelation 1 anyway. You see, Star Wars are among the stars. The angels. And George Lucas with his Star Wars movies is only drawing on the original story of a great war that has started way back and today it continues on this planet. So war broke out in heaven. Star Wars among the stars. By pride an exalted angel fell. And my friend, that's true of you and I tonight. If I take center place, it will bring us down individually. That's why the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Put me first, says Jesus. And your life will be better for it. Now here's a question that some people have. Why didn't God just zap that devil? Why didn't he just wipe him out now? Get rid of him. Would have been nice, you think, don't you? Well, God is smarter than us, let me tell you. Here is Bill English. The Prime Minister of New Zealand. But let's say it's the Prime Minister of Samoa. Let's say the Prime Minister of Samoa, like the Prime Minister of New Zealand, is accused by the cabinet of stealing government funds. 
Sir Mr. English, or the Prime Minister of Samoa, or of Australia, or of any other country, he says, I have a problem. I'm being accused of stealing government money. So those various prime ministers, they come up with a smart idea. I know what I'll do, they say. I'll bring in the police and I'll shoot those guys who accused me of all that wrong. Would you think the Prime Minister of Samoa was... <laughs> that doesn't translate so easy, does it, bro? <laughs> Would you think the Prime Minister of Samoa was innocent because he shot the cabinet? No, you'd say the opposite, wouldn't you? He's trying to cover something up. So we got rid of those guys. This was the problem God faced. God comes in, zap, boom, gone, he's gone. And all the beings of God's creation. What are they going to say? Ah, watch God. Don't cross God. Boom, you're gone. <laughs> Would people love God? Well, they would fear him for sure, wouldn't they? But they would not love him. And God operates on love, my friend. So that's why he didn't destroy him immediately. He is a God who acts on love, you see. And he wants to relate to him on the basis of love. Not of being scared of God. So he let the devil show his true hand. So that then people could see what he really was up to. There was no other way for created beings to understand this being. Now Jesus taught this principle. He said one night, or one day, a farmer planted some wheat. And the crops began to grow. Until the day came when the servants came in one night and they said, Master, somebody has planted weeds among your wheat. Shall we go and pull up the weeds and burn them? He said, no, no, don't do that. Because if you pull up the weeds, you'll pull up the nice new young wheat with them. You'll destroy the wheat. No, he said, let them both grow together and when the harvest time comes, we will see clearly what is weed and what is wheat. And because the wheat is now ripe, you won't destroy the wheat. That's the principle Jesus was sharing. And so the devil was thrown down to this world. God's most recent creation. And what a beautiful creation it was that God had made. And I would remind you, my friend, that the Bible says that it was Jesus who created this world. John teaches it. Paul teaches it in Paul. Jesus made this world. And to this world the devil came. 
You've read the story of the talking snake, haven't you? Into that garden home one day came a snake. But he was a front for the devil. He was a medium. Satan spoke through that snake. That's why John in the Revelation calls him so the great dragon that serpent or snake of old called the devil and Satan. Because the devil Use the snake as a front. You know, the snake in ancient world was the god of chaos for the Egyptians. Here is Apap, the snake god. The god of chaos, destruction, and evil. Isn't it interesting? You see the snake in the tree here, even. When the Bible talks about the snake in a tree meeting Eve, it's supported by the ancient religions of people of Egypt. Don't think this is just cooked up. I thank God for a picture like that. So the snake was a medium for Satan. Now let's just talk a little bit about love, genuine love for a moment. The real love will always give you the opportunity to say yes to it or no to it. If you cannot say no, it is not love. You are like a puppet on a string. You are like a robot. You have no control and choice. God did not make robots. He made people with a choice. And love is risky. Because his children could say no to him. But that is genuine love. Genesis 2 verse 16 now. We pick up the story on earth now. And the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Every tree you can eat, Adam and Eve. But there is one. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. What's going on here, my friend? Why did God have one tree that they couldn't eat? Because this is where human beings could exercise their freedom of choice. This is where they could say yes to God or no to God. It was like a polling station. How do you like elections here in Samoa? <laughs> we vote, don't we? Well, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was like the polling booth. God was saying to Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, vote for me. By not eating of that tree. And you will have life, Adam and Eve. But Adam and Eve. 
You have a choice. If you want to vote for Satan, then you will eat the tree or from the tree. But Adam and Eve, you need to understand there is a consequence to your choice. It is death. God was not saying because you don't do what I want you to do boom, I'm going to zap you. No. He was telling them if you don't if you do eat of the tree, you are dis di disengaging from your life support system. Because life comes only from God. So to eat of the tree is to vote for Satan who is a created being. He cannot give life. But Adam and Eve, if you don't eat, you are staying with me. And that means life. It's your choice, but, but there are consequences to your choice. And so one day, you remember the story Eve stepped up to the polling booth, right? And she was met there by the devil. Now notice what the devil said to Eve. Now the serpent, verse 1 of chapter 3, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Haven't we heard those words before, my friend? Remember them? I will make myself like the Most High. Way back. Now, Eve, you be God. You be in God's place where God should be. And sadly, Eve fell for it. Now, I want you to notice here the devil was making a two pronged attack on God's character right here in the garden. Number one. He was telling Eve, God doesn't really love you, Eve. Because Eve, if he loved you, would he really not let you, would he, wouldn't he, if he loved you, he'd let you eat the tree, off the tree. But he's holding something back, Eve. He doesn't want you to be like him. He's looking after his own interests. He's not looking after you. So he was really saying, God doesn't really love you. And he spread that lie a lot in this planet. But he was also saying this. God is not a just God, Eve. God said if you eat this tree, you will die. Rubbish. You won't die. God's not going to destroy you for eating an apple or whatever. His laws don't matter, Eve. Go and eat. Have a good feed. You see the point? 
Oh, va voor mij. A two-pronged attack on the character of God. Lua met haar op en als of je zat aan die laat me alleen toe. He's not a loving God. And he's not a just God. You can disobey and do what you want. He's not going to do anything. Oh, that's a dangerous attack, my friend. And human beings down through the centuries have fallen for one of those two things. How often when we do something bad, When we sin, we think God could never forgive me. He doesn't love me. That's the devil's voice, my friend. Or sometimes God's commandments tell us to do something. And the devil whispers, don't worry. It's not a problem. Everybody else is doing it. My friend, that's a dangerous thing. He's a just God. He's a loving God. The Bible teaches that very clearly. Genesis 3, 6 now. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, just stop for a moment. You imagine you're standing with Eve, and here's this snake munching on a piece of fruit and he's talking to you how are you doing Eve man <laughs> this fruit it's pretty good how many times have you heard a snake talking Eve that's what that verse is saying This was no minor temptation for Paul. Eve. It was very attractive. If a snake can talk, imagine what will happen to her when she eats it. And listen here, man. Don't blame the ladies. Eve took the fruit with some very subtle temptations from the devil. But Adam just walked along and he just ate that thing. And she gave it to him. We're in this together. Don't blame others. So she ate it. She also gave some to her husband with her and he ate. And the tragic thing, my friend, as soon as they ate that fruit, they knew something was wrong. It began to break relationships. First of all, they hid from God. They knew something was wrong. So when God came walking in the garden to visit with his children, they were hiding in the bushes. And that's why human beings have been running from God ever since. That's why people in my country they say there is no God. It's just another way to run from God. It's so nice to think he doesn't exist. But he does exist. And we're just fooling ourselves. We're just hiding in the bushes. Not only did they hide from God, the one who made them with his own hand. It's a tragic picture. Their creator who made them out of love. They are hiding from him. But it strained their marriage. God said, Adam, have you eaten of the fruit? Ah, that woman you gave me, 
She's the problem. And you see the strain now between the marriage, the humans. As soon as sin came, relationships were fractured. And Satan attacked the animal kingdom. The devil made the snake crawl on his belly because of what he had got him involved in. And so into this world from that point, there came disharmony, disease, depression, destruction, divorce, and death. And it's all because of Satan. These are the acts of the devil. God did not make these things. The devil is the one behind it all, my friend. You read the story of Job. He's a good man. He's a godly man. And the curtain is pulled aside and we're shown that it's the devil that killed his kids. It's the devil that smashed his animals to death. He was the one behind it all. But what does the devil do? He's not only the author of deception and of destruction. Jesus said that. He is a liar and a murderer. And as human beings, we often listen to his deceptions. He tells us, just do that thing. It'll be nice. And we fall for it. Not realizing that he has one reason for his lie. Your destruction and my destruction. He's not a good devil. These are the two activities he lives for, Jesus said. But what does he do? He blames it all on God. He says, God did all this. What happens when an earthquake strikes? strikes? The insurance companies call it an act of God. We lose a loved one. Why God? Why, why, why did you do this? God? You see what's happening here? The devil is blaming all of this on God. Because he's a liar. So, how can a loving God reach a world that believes the devil's lies? How, how, how can God do that? The Bible tells us God came walking in the garden. Adam and Eve came out of the bushes because God called out Adam, where are you? I long for you, Adam. Eve, I love you. Why are you hiding from me? I care about you. You're my children. That's what God came doing. The Bible says he came in the cool of the day. Adam, where are you? What a beautiful call. As soon as human beings sin and mess things up, God came looking for human beings because he does love us. And when God caught up with Adam and Eve, he made a promise. He said, I will put enmity, antagonism, 
Between you and the woman. He's really saying between the devil and the woman. Between your seed or your children, the devil's children. And her children, her seed. But then he was referring to one seed in particular, singular. He said, her seed. Your seed. He shall bruise your head. And you shall bruise his heel. Jesus was, God was making a promise. To our first parents. Adam and Eve. You're going to have a child one day. There will be a human being born. Who will crush that snake's head. Meaning the devil. But as he crushes the head of that snake, the snake will get him in the heel. There will be a cost. So come to the book of Revelation now. John picks it up. Revelation 12, verse 4 and 5. Falinga, lima. John comes to the heart of the story. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. With the moon under her feet. And on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child. The woman was pregnant in other words. She cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was caught up to God and to his throne. There in the heart of revelation, my friend, is the gift of Christmas. It is the story of a baby that would one day be born among us. Isaiah 9 verse 6. The Bible says, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. My friend, do you realize what the Bible is saying here? God became a human being. And he was given to the human race for eternity. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This is love, my friend. What love is this? And so one day, 2,000 years ago, he came. He grew up, came to the Jordan River here, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. He fed the hungry, he healed the sick people, he touched the lepers. Nobody wanted to come near the lepers. They were smelly. They had horrible sores all over them. But Jesus touched them. He befriended the outcasts. People that no one else wanted to have anything to do with. Jesus sat down with them. He ate in their homes. He slept under their roofs. He comforted the grieving. A broken-hearted mother. 
is walking out of the city beside the coffin. And Jesus is just coming into the city. He sees the poor mother. He says, don't cry. He stops. He looks at the boy who's dead and he says, get up. And he united the mother and the son. What a God. This, this Jesus cast out demons. The demons possessed people so they had no clothes on. They lived with the dead. They were violent. They cried out night and day. And then Jesus came past. Oh, my friend, tonight, there is a story of long ago. Men roamed in darkness, nowhere to go. One day the scene changed. They ceased to cry. There was a reason. Jesus passed by. And he still passes by today, your life and mine. He raised the dead. You see, he came to seek what was lost. And to fix what was broken. That's what Jesus came for. How do you explain it all? His name is called Emmanuel. That's how you explain it. And Emmanuel means he was God with us. God didn't send second fiddle as we say. God became one of us in Jesus Christ. John says in his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him. Without him, nothing was made. That was made. And the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. Thank God for that. The creator became a creature. I was in Tonga a few years ago running the, these meetings. King George had just been coronated. And the people of Tonga were amazed when King George went and visited a commoner. A little girl who was dying of leukemia. The king visiting a commoner. Now I'm thrilled that what the king of Tonga did. But my friend, it is nothing compared to what the King Jesus did. Because Christ became a commoner. He became a human being. He just did not visit us. He is one of us for eternity. God became a commoner. You see, my friend, Why? disease oh, my. and destruction and divorce Tete anga. and depression Tete anga. and death, Oti. these are the acts of Satan. But this is the act of God. God is not like the devil says. Isaiah 53 verse 3 and 4. The Bible says, He is despised and rejected by men. He is a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Surely he has borne our griefs and has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and Oh, what a saviour. He carries your burdens tonight. You've got burdens that are resting on your mind. You wonder how you can 
carry on. Leave it with Jesus, my friend. He carried our burdens. You see, love broke Satan's possessive grip on planet Earth when ole, Jesus came. Ole alofa e matua talepe ai fainga satani le lo langi le nei. God came to end our human suffering. Afio mai le tua ina ia fa ngata ia le mafatia o te ngata. God came to give us a forever hope when Jesus came. Afio mai ia le tua ina ia mai ia le fa moe moe fa bau mo te ngata. How did he do it? Ah, my friends, this is when God's empire struck back. Now, I know in George Lucas's movies, it was the baddies who struck back. <laughs> but in the great real story, this is when God's empire struck back. When did it happen? It happened on an old rugged cross. Where God's empire struck back at the devil. In the book of Hebrews, the New Testament Christians, Jewish Christians, the Bible says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, since we have are human beings, he, God himself, likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy the devil. Who has the, who has the power of death, the devil. And he might release or free those who through their fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Did you see it, my friend? At the cross, the Bible says, the devil was defeated. So how was the devil defeated at the cross? Well, you remember, the two-pronged attack on God's character. What were they? God doesn't love us. Number two, God is not a just God. His laws don't matter. At the cross, my friend, those two charges were refuted. At the cross, the justice of God was seen, my friend. Paul says, Christ Jesus, whom, whom God set forth by his blood, by his death, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness or his justice so that he might be just. What did God say to Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve, if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat of it. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Paul put it this way. The wages of sin is death. That's what God was saying to Adam and Eve. So why did Jesus die? God made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us. All through, this, all through this Bible, this is the truth. Christ died for us. Your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole world were put on him. Sin matters. 
Because when he took your sin and my sin and the sin of the whole world, Christ died. The cross is the greatest answer to the justice of God. Sin matters. Sin is a big deal, my friend. But at the cross, we see the love of God. The Bible says, God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What an amazing God, my friend. God not only demonstrated his justice, but he demonstrated his love because Christ took our sin and our punishment. For God so loved the world that he gave or sacrificed his only son. My friend, God's love is high. Paul wrote one day about the love of God. He said it's high, it's wide, it's long, and it's deep. How high is the love of God? God's love is so high, he reached up to heaven and brought God off his throne to become a human being and and to die in our place. God's love is deep, my friend. For God so loved the world, the Bible says. The world he's talking about is not a ball of dirt. In the Bible, world stands for people. But a certain type of person. A person who is in rebellion against his maker. That's why Paul said, while we were yet sinners, he gave his son. While we were enemies, the Bible says. While we were running from God. God was running to us at the cross. God's love, my friend, is very deep. Your sin and my sin may be deep. But where sin abounds, God's love much more abounds. That's the teaching of the Bible, my friend. God demonstrated his love. While we were sinners. God's love is wide, my friend. Tonight. I know there are some here tonight who are listening. They're saying God loves her, God loves him. God accepts them. But not me. You are wrong, my friend. Jesus said to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that whoever, that word means if there were only one sinner, Christ would have died for that man. That's what he's getting at. Only one sinner. God would still have spread his arms on an old rugged cross for that one What an amazing God. How many people are there? Seven billion. What's one? In seven billion. What's one lost world? in all of space that seems to go into eternity for God so loved the world that even one sinner he would have died God is just my friend God is loving 
That's where God's empire struck back. And that is why hope is sure tonight. It happened in the civil war in the United States of America. America was caught in the grip of a great war over slavery. And to keep the union together. Between July 1 and July 3, a huge battle took place not far from Washington. The Battle of Gettysburg. I have walked over that battlefield. When the battle was finished after three days, there were piles of moaning, groaning men. As the sun set, on that last day, you could hear men groaning. Men without arms. Men whose legs had been torn off by bombs and bullets. And it was a horrific scene. Some 55,000 casualties on that battlefield. But if we could have seen that night, when the sun set, we had been there, we would have seen a man running around with a little lantern. He was the father of one of the soldiers. His farm was a couple of hills over. And he knew his boy was in that fight. And when the battle had finished, and the sun had set, he came looking for his boy. He would run from one pile of moaning, groaning men. And he would call out, John Hartman! John Hartman! Your father calls you. John, where are you? He was hoping to hear his boy. But he continued to run from one group of bodies to another. Finally he heard the sound he was hoping he'd hear. Father, I'm over here. John his father ran to him. There was his boy wounded on the battlefield. Those big father farmer hands picked up his boy. And he carried him back to the farm. I've thought of that story that came from that battlefield. My friend, Jesus is about to come. We've seen that the last two nights. He's coming to take his children home. He wants to live with them forever. But some of us are wounded on the battlefield. In fact, in this battle, we all get wounded But the Father comes looking for us. In the battlefield of life. And he cries out, to us. My son. My daughter. I love you. Where are you? Oh, my friend, I can hear that call of God today. Like he said to Adam and Eve. Adam, where are you? Eve, I love you. I'll have you back. I love you, you're mine. My friend, listen to this song tonight as we close. Hear the voice of our God calling to us. Yeah. 
things tonight before we close. Maybe tonight you sense that you're like that boy on the battlefield. And you want to respond to the Father's call. Perhaps you already love the Father. You're one of his children. 
But God is speaking to you, go find my kids, bring them home. If you'd like to say yes to God tonight, just raise your hand, Lord. Maybe I'm on the battlefield of life. I want the Father's hand. I want to be the hands of my Father to reach others. If you're at home tonight watching on television, just bow your head and tell God. You're at one of our downlink sites. Just raise your hand for one of those two things. May God bless you. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you tonight for watching over this program. Thank you, Father, that the devil is unmasked. But thank you at the same time we see a God who is wonderfully loving to his children. Thank you, Father, that your call goes to all of us. Adam, Eve, where are you? I love you. I'm coming soon. I want you to live with me forever in my forever kingdom. Bless us tonight as we go to our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this program. If you'd like to see more in the series, why not contact the number on your screen right now?